Hey everybody, Preston Brin here with our weekly roundup brought to you by Trader User Group. This is for the trading week ending June 16th, 2017. Interesting week, uh, folks. Um, I, in my um, little commentary um, by the video, I've said it's a yin and yang week, uh, a world of two realities. And you know, and that's something that Barron's had also called out in their weekend uh, overview this weekend. We saw the feds raise the rates and we had the surprise announcement of Amazon buying Whole Foods and we've continued to see oil drift lower, which is something that um, for our members, we're continuing to make money every week in the oil markets. Um, and for our members, I'll go through it again Sunday night, uh, but it's just a trade that given the current environment in the uh, energy markets we're taking advantage of. But first, what you see on the screen here is a weekly chart of the S&P 500 E-mini futures. Um, and what I said before, it's kind of a world of two realities. Um, one is theory and the other is reality, I guess. Um, and that's just something that um, I believe we're seeing. And, and in fact, Barron's even called it out this weekend too. Uh, most of us, though, as I say, kind of live in the real world. Uh, but if we listen to the policy statement and in the press conference by Janet Yellen, who we affectionately call AKA our Aunt B, she came up there and a lot of people were expecting her to deliver a very sweet recipe for blueberry pie. A lot of sugar, a lot of butter, a lot of fat. Boy, it tastes really good if you like blueberry pie. But she came out and delivered a little bit more of a healthy blueberry pie, a little bit more tart, less sugar. It was basically a more hawkish statement that she came out with. Um, they obviously raised the rates by 25 basis points, which is what everybody was expecting. But she said they're still on course for another rate hike this year, and they're going to start um, cutting the $4.5 trillion U.S. balance sheet. And a lot of the price action interpreted her remarks as more hawkish than they were expecting. But she went on in her press conference and essentially said that the um, uh, inflation, we expect to see inflation coming out. Uh, we expect to see the market start to take hold. Yet, if you look at the bond market and you look at what uh, the price action seems to indicate it doesn't believe that. Um, we see first the bond market is pricing in um, about a 38, 39% chance of another rate hike this year, even though the Fed said they're going to hike it again. Um, we're seeing a falling yield curve as measured by the difference between the 10-year and the 2-year. And that tends to show uh, lower uh, future economic growth, right? And consumers who live in the real world, the consumer sentiment dropped by about 2.7% uh, this week. And U.S. CPI, which measures uh, consumer um, inflation, fell 1.7% or fell to 1.7%. So let's see who's right, the theory and the academic world or the real world. Um, and right now, the bond market is siding with the real world and realities. We'll look at bonds here in just a minute. Um, but if we look at the S&P 500, you can see here that the drop on the screen here, I've got a lot of lines, a lot of action going on. You can see the all-time high here at 24.43. You can see this upsloping trend line uh, right there, and we're testing it right here. I've said that I believe that should we take out 24.12, it's, it's a, nothing's a given in the markets, but testing the 2400, which is a natural area right there. You can see the the, the tendency for the markets um, to kind of uh, come in around that area. And we spent a number of, um, uh, almost a couple of months really, at that 2400 level trying to penetrate. And then when we finally got up above it, we came down and did a retest a week later and now we're holding up here. This upsloping trend line right here remains intact, but should it beat, should it fail to hold, we're going to come back down and by then the upward vector in the 50 EMA is probably going to meet the 2400 area and then we could test it right here. Now, 
just like this pullback that we had right here, I was uh, telling our members we are a buy the dip mode. We are still in a buy the dip mode. I am still bullish, but uh, I'm cautious at these levels up here. Okay, I'm not ready to add too many long positions, although we're selective. I've got a couple of long positions we'll be putting on this week in our secret trader for our members. But you can see here that on this chart going back, um, in fact, if, if, if I take it back, let's just take it back and make it a year-to-date chart right here. Right? I'm just going to come back and make it a year-to-date chart roughly. You can see in this year-to-date chart, where we've got a lot of volume hanging out. We got a lot of volume hanging out at this price level right here. And then we've got a very wide base of support right here in volume. Okay. This volume over price is where buyers are fighting with the sellers to control the market. And you can see that we went uh, and then going back into last year, down the price action was down here with the Trump bump, and then we just moved up dramatically, and then we had a long consolidation period here. We finally broke out in May, middle of May, and now we're in this little thinly controlled area up here. I believe the odds favor the markets to come back and settle back down into this area here, um, unless the Trump administration or um, Congress and senators can come together and get some of these some of this legislation passed, which basically was a primary reason why the markets had this big move back down here. The markets, as you know, are a forward pricing mechanism, meaning they move in where they expect the price action will be, not where it is right now. This is why right brain traders generally trade the headline news. If you're trading the headline news, you're already three to six months behind schedule, three to five months behind schedule, all right? A lot of the gains have already been priced into the market. And that's why when you jump in as a rat brain trader, you know, following your headline news on your rat brain business journal of the day, which is the National Enquirer or the USA Today paint by color picture, beautifully laid out uh, newspaper, you're going to be behind the eight ball, okay? You just will be. Um, but if you look here, uh, if price action, if, if all of this is based on expectation, folks, uh, and it's maintaining this because there's still a belief that the senators and congressmen who want to be reelected, what drives them is not dinner plate issues for, for middle America, I promise you. What drives our politicians, and I think half of them are crooks anyway, on both sides of the aisle. But that's just my own personal political opinion. But what drives them is whether they're going to get reelected or not. That's all they care about. And I can tell you, if they don't get through some of this legislation, you're going to see a lot of them go down. So that's the only thing driving them. So the markets are maintaining these levels up here in hopes of some of this regulation coming through. Um, so a drift down here in the summer months uh, would not surprise me. Um, still on the wing in the prayer that these folks will get stuff due, you know. Now, I, from a political affiliation standpoint, I don't care who's in office. We play the markets and the price action based on, you know, who's driving policy, right? At the end of the day, it's a dollars and cents um, move for us and our members. We're traders. And, and, you know, you may have a personal opinion and a wish and a hope and a dream and blah, blah, blah. But from a price action standpoint, from a monetary standpoint, Whoever's in office, that's the way we play. This is what's happening right now in the in, in the market. So um, I, I do see a little bit of a pullback here. If we do stretch a little bit higher, I will be a little bit surprised. But we're basically in this range chop mode right here. Okay. If we look at the Dow, now the Dow this past Friday, <coughs> excuse me. If I look at the Dow, let me find it on here, it made all-time highs. The Dow futures made all-time highs on Friday. You can see here, uh, as I move it around, we made all-time highs on Friday, closed near the upper boundary of the day, right? I mean, that was a bullish signal. But again, I think the upside is rather limited, and I think we have more risk to the downside. But I don't see the market coming unglued. Again, like the S&P, I could see a little bit of a weakening in price coming down in this price zone down here 
or possibly down here because you can see where the buyers versus sellers are duking it out and right now the buyers are winning all right but you can see this is where all the volume is taking place so we've got a lot of support down in this area here very similar to what I'm seeing in the S&P 500 uh, futures all right now NASDAQ is having a little bit of a pullback here but nothing egregious nothing not a big deal you can see right here where on this daily chart we pulled right back and right now we are testing the 50 EMA you can see that 50 EMA right there you can see this big uh, support area right there and then a bigger support area and I, if I highlight it all you can see you know where we we got stuck for quite some time you can see this area there we were stuck a lot and you can see all this buy-in versus selling volume fighting it out until the buyers won out took us up to this level up here buying and selling and we kind of hung out right there we stretched a bit up here and and I was telling our members we do not want to chase it and then sure enough it pulled right back into the center of this lower volume area should this break here should we lose the 50 EMA you can see there's very little buyers willing to step in the way right here I think they'll wait until it comes back down here and then they will pick up again for me I would love to see that too if it comes down here I'll be a happy buyer of Nasdaq futures uh, near term I think it's a bit stretched could it run a little bit higher sure anything could but I do believe the near term the, the probability favors a more of a downside move than an upside move we're still in a buy on the dip there is no uh, bed in this chart right here now we call this one um, and it's a good bed it's not a poor man's bed right so uh, there is no bearish divergence in this so this does indicate to me um, any kind of pullback this one will be a little bit more of a pullback than normal and you can see some of the stocks that make up the NASDAQ 100 like Facebook is one of them um, is part of the FANG stock you can see it looks very similar the 50 EMA is holding up um, I could see it pulling back just a little bit giving up some we had that bearish divergence in this uh, uh, Facebook so that would signal a little bit more of a pullback but not a lot right um, and then of course Amazon when it announced its its um, takeover of Whole Foods you can see here that on that day I mean Amazon was up 23 points right but just to show you the skittishness of some of these that was the bad day for Amazon came all the way down there but notice it closed right in that level there so it closed in the upper half of the trading range but this just shows you there's a lot of skittish hands in Amazon right and then you can see these next few bars right here they're all over the place they're up they're down they're up they're down and then when it announced the uh, Whole Foods it gapped up a pretty good bit and it closed in the lower end of the gap that to me is more bearish than bullish even though it's bullish that it gapped up 23 points right so I, I do believe to me the key levels for Amazon are going to be the high and low of that big move down that we had last Friday all right, I'm, I, I think Amazon will probably come down and test this level back here again. Now, it may stretch up here, but I think eventually it's going to come back and test this level here. So for those of you that have been watching these tech stocks um, and not participating and you want to get in, I would just kind of sit on your hands just a little bit. Uh, you can see the 50 EMA, this red line here, is providing pretty good support. Every time it goes down around the 50 EMA, you've got buyers coming in and pushing it back up right so that is part of the fang stock and then of course you got apple um, right that's another one in there and you can see here now apple has come undone just a little bit more than the others right again on the daily chart apple has taken out its 50 ema okay all apple has really done though is come down to this this level right here of of the next level down of uh, buyers versus sellers right and that's just I mean you know when we were stretched up in this level here you can see just the thin uh, area here that we held and it was just a given that Apple you know going long at Apple in this level up here would have been just really a bad rat brain kind of trade okay 
at these levels here. So expecting it to, once it broke, as you can see, there's very little volume until you get down to this area here. So I would expect some of this to hold up for Apple. Should it break, there is a limited volume here, and then the next big area for Apple is down around the 116 to 112 area down here. I don't see Apple going that far. I see it kind of resting down in this area here before gathering steam back. But we could be in for a period of longer consolidation. If you look right here, we were about a two-month consolidation period. So we could see a two-month consolidation period across um, uh, those FANG stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and then the others to kind of round these out. I'll look at Microsoft and Google. They've added Microsoft in, so they call it the FAM. I guess that's how you pronounce it, I guess what? So if you look at Microsoft, here's the same thing. Testing the 50 EMA right here. There is no divergences. Uh, we've come back down to the more normalized peak area of where buyers versus sellers are duking it out. Uh, and again, uh, this volume over price works very well coupled with the other indicators that we use in our group. But you could see here, this is the resting area trading zone, and we're kind of sitting right up above it. The 50 EMA is right in the middle of it. So we could kind of stay in a chop mode right here. If it breaks, that's probably the likelihood of where we're going next, you know, down around the 65 area for Microsoft. And then, of course, there's Google. All right. And if we look at Google, same thing, testing the 50 EMA. Um, and you can see right here, not as much volume in that area. It's relatively thin, but that's kind of where we are. Should this break, we've got a little bit of an area right there that maybe may catch it, and another area right there, which are just gap fills that we may kind of find ourselves in. Um, so I'm going to watch Google very closely here, but should it hold up, then obviously, um, we may see some chop before a little bit of a rise higher. Now remember, we are coming into the month of uh, July. July is the worst trading month of the year seasonality-wise for the S&P. You've heard it sell in May and go away. May is one of the worst, but July is the worst. So we're going to see lower volume, people on vacation, um, and you're just going to see price action tossed around a bit more with some of the limited volume out there or lower volume, not necessarily limited. So these are just some of the, the FANG stocks that I wanted to just showcase what had happened. If we come over and we look at volatility um, and just kind of see where volatility was hanging out, uh, this past week, it ticked up just a little bit, but not enough to really concern me. I mean, heck, it finished the day or the week at 1038. So you could see vol actually got up to 12.4. Big whoop. We're still in the green zone and volatility for our members. Or for you non-members, you know that, uh, or you may not know, but uh, what we do is different strategies uh, we play out based on what zone volatility is sitting at, and then, and we're measuring it via the VIX. And then we look at the contango backwardation of the term structure of vol futures, uh, and we make some plays on that as well. So this is just kind of still kind of a benign area. We may see a little bit more chop in vol. You can see where vol on this daily chart here, it kind of runs steady. And then you get a spike, then it runs steady, you get a spike, we come down, run steady, get a spike, then you come down again. So I expect this kind of action to continue. And the spikes here, you know, take us into the uh, yellow zone where VIX goes over 15. Um, and you can never predict you know, when these spikes in volatility occur, nor can you predict after the spike, is it going to recalibrate and come back down in the green zone, or are we going to move up even higher, right? Uh, moving up higher can be uh, a detriment to um, uh, your trading portfolio, depending on how you've got yourself hedged. Uh, for members in our group that are portfolio margin members, um, we have special trades that we take. Uh, where we're hedged 100% and we leverage portfolio margin. If you are a portfolio margin trader um, and you're not in our group, I highly encourage you to come in um, and check us out because um, it'll, it could save you a, la a lifeline there. So this is volatility. Now, if we look at the bond market, 
the bond market is essentially, you know, taking the other side of reality. It's the yang, or the, it's the yang to uh, Janet Yellen's yin, right? In yin and yang theory. You can see here, uh, bond market actually made a new high um, on, the, on the 14th, right, this week. And we're just sitting here at this level here. Now, I, this the higher bonds go, the lower interest rates go. If we look at the 30-year interest rate, I mean, we are sitting on key support levels right now. Huge. If this breaks, uh, bonds are going to go up, yields are going to go down, equity markets are going to go down as well. Uh, it's just, it's not going to be um, a pretty thing. Um, at least near term. Now we're setting ourselves up for that. That does not mean that's what's going to happen. Even looking at the 10-year rate, if we look at the 10-year Treasury yield right here, sitting at 2.15, you can see here we're making a series of lower highs and lower lows. And if you look at the U.S. dollar market, it shows the same thing. <clears throat> look at the dollar, guys. Uh, lower highs, lower lows. You can see the downslope and trend line the 50 EMA cross the 200 EMA, right? That suggests that on, on a longer term basis going out the next six months, we're going to see basically continued weakness in the U.S. dollar, which I don't like because I'm going to be spending a couple of months this uh, uh, coming up in, in, in Europe doing some seminars. I would like to see a stronger dollar for personal reasons, obviously. But you can see here the dollar held up for you know, about two weeks, two and a half weeks until we finally broke the 50 EMA and then we've been below that ever since. Um, and, you know, our play has been mostly um, not short the dollar. Uh, we've been mostly long the euro. And you can see the euro here just constantly making new highs, right? 2017 highs and we're sitting in this area here now I think it'll be a little bit choppy up in this area as it consolidates before it moves higher again um, and the British pound well they've got the issues with Theresa May and and, and um, the Brexit and they're going to start their negotiations shortly so the pound is going to be very choppy longer term I think it's going to be bullish it's going to be a great play short term it's more a swing trade and a day traders kind of play okay if we look at gold gold is kind of following along um, with with what I've said which is I thought gold to be honest was going to be down in this area right here it almost made it when it came there it missed my target of around the 1200 area by about five dollars an ounce right by five dollars and then we had this huge run up here and during this run I was not interested in playing along um, and then once we broke it we're now sitting just slightly under the 200 EMA you can see the cross of the 250 EMA to the upside that would suggest that this a leg and we're going to get a B leg here which is typical after you complete a three four five pattern and at the end of the C leg uh, gold is going to tell us what it wants to do. Price action is going to tell us. I don't listen to the gold bug, uh, 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 the gold bugs that believe, or the bulls that believe gold is going to go to ten thousand an ounce, and I don't listen to the bears either. I'm just following price action. And at the beginning of the year, if you guys recall, I was bullish gold. I still believe gold is going to finish, even from where we are here, higher at the end of the year than where we are right now. But in the interim, I just think we're going to have some chop, and I'm not willing to play the chop in the gold market. Silver is the same way. Uh, you can see silver, although it is a little bit weaker than gold, um, I can see it possibly coming down and testing this key pivot down here around 16 um, before it kind of winds up again. And if you recall, also with silver, we were bullish silver. Uh, way back last year when it was in the 13 so it was a good trade for us back then um, now if we come over and look at oil uh, in the energy markets this one's great for us uh, we've we've made money every week in the oil trade as it's done one of these things like this right we're making a series of lower highs and a series of lower lows that is a classic case of a trend. 
Now, granted, the width of the channel is very wide, so that suckers a lot of people in when it's in an up mode inside this channel to say, well, oil is finally going bullish. And if you recall, Goldman Sachs came out up at this level right up here and said uh, oil is going to finish the year this year in the low to mid 60s. And I just kind of laughed. I told our members, let's go the other way on it. And that's exactly what happened. And now we're back down here again, it's testing the 2017 lows. Can it go lower? Yes. Um, can it go higher from here? Yes. Um, will it break this channel? Um, not in the near term. I think we're going to kind of stay in this shaded zone a little bit. Uh, we may stray a little here. We may stray a little here, but we got huge forces, uh, which I go through with my members, um, channeling oil in a compressed fashion. And we're making money on it. So that's just you know, a, a quick overview of oil. If you're interested in how we trade oil and doing that, if you can trade options on futures, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out because uh, each week we're taking money out of the market. And until this environment changes, we're going to continue with that strategy. Um, <clears throat> we've also covered things in agriculture, meats, softs, a number of different uh, commodities that we're that we're looking at um, and a number of different sectors that I think will show themselves nicely over the next 90 days as we move through the summer months. All right, everybody, that's a little bit about where we are right now for this um, weekly roundup. I hope you guys have a great weekend. For those of you that are non-members, um, I would encourage you to come in and check us out. Take care, folks, and I'll be in touch with you again next weekend. For our members, I'll see you tomorrow night for our weekly uh, market watch. Take care, folks. Ciao.